Right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's session, uh, previewing FCM's new energy efficiency guide for affordable housing providers with some great speakers from FCM's Green Municipal Fund. My name is Jacob Gorenkoff, and I'm the Director of Programs and Strategic Initiatives for the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which I am currently on in Ottawa is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people, and I thank them for allowing me to live, work, and play on their land. Uh, today's session is in real time. You should now be able to see a title screen of today's presentation and be able to hear me via your computer speakers, headset, or through your phone if you've chosen to dial in. You'll notice that today's session is in Zoom meeting format. So to minimize background noise, we'd kindly ask that you remain muted unless called upon to ask a question. And if you do have a question, please type it in the chat or raise your hand on the Zoom control panel, and we'll address as many questions as we can at the end of the session. So today we are joined by speakers from FCM's Green Municipal Fund for a sneak peek of their new energy efficiency guide for affordable housing providers. This energy efficiency guide is meant to demystify energy retrofits by providing clear steps that help you take action. This session is meant to be interactive, hence being in meeting format. So make sure you get your questions ready while our speakers are presenting. On that note, I'd like to welcome our speakers, uh, Paulina Asensio, I hope I'm saying that correctly, Paulina, uh, Edward Beckett and Jen Arnfield. Uh, Paulina, over to you. Thank you, Jacob, and welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. So my name is Paulina, and I am a project officer of the capacity development uh, for FCM's Green Municipal Fund. I am joining us today from the traditional and ancestral territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And in the context of our conversation today, determining energy priorities and climate action will inevitably impact indigenous communities within or adjacent to your communities. So we invite you to open dialogue, connect with, and align your activities with those of your indigenous neighbors and partners. Uh, before we jump into our content for the next hour, I have a few housekeeping items to review. Uh, so please know that this session is being recorded. Today's session is being delivered in English. Um, we'll be using the chat box for our dialogue and questions, but we will also be using Menti for some of our interactions and spot today. Uh, my colleague Sharon Levinsky is joining us today along with our panelists and will address your comments throughout the sessions. Uh, finally, please keep yourself muted throughout the session today. We hope to use this Zoom meeting uh, for these sessions to allow for the chat function and interactivity, uh, but we will not be using video today aside from our speakers. So please keep your video off as well. And on that note, uh, we recommend that you set your view to speaker view to minimize the participant icons you have on your screen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, FCM, is a nonprofit organization that acts as the national voice of local governments of Canada. FCM's mandate includes delivering programs that build municipalities' capacities to deliver innovative, cost-effective, and local solutions to environmental challenges and to enhance the quality of life for their citizens. Uh, next slide, please. So our largest program, the Green Municipal Fund, it's a one billion program funded by the Government of Canada to support municipalities and their partners to improve air, water and soil quality and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We do this through a unique mix of funding, resources and training in five areas of activity, energy, waste, water, transportation and land use. And the fund is open to affordable housing sector, including municipalities, nonprofit and co-ops. Next slide, please. Next, you can just keep clicking. Thanks. Um, as I said earlier, my name is Paulina Asensio and I work for the Sustainable Affordable Housing Initiative, at the Green Municipal Fund. We will also be hearing today from Edward Beckett. So Edward is a building energy specialist and a regional energy coach for BC. Uh, Edward's time working on energy management projects as a Red Seal electrician convinced him uh, on the benefits of energy management, and he made the switch to become an energy specialist and regional energy goes with BC and PHA. He continues to leverage his industry knowledge in connecting the benefits of energy and asset management with affordable housing providers and finding those win-win solutions for everyone. We will also be hearing today from Jen Arnfield. She is the lead of the Sustainable Affordable Housing at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. 
She led the design of the funding offer and is currently focused on the program continuous improvement and operational effectiveness. Uh, I also want to thank my colleague Sharon, who is providing us with some tech support in the background, and Emily Hayes, who will be monitoring the chat box. Next slide, please. Um, so here is the plan for our time together. I am going to kick things off with a fun energy trivia, followed by a brief energy one-on-one, -on -one, a few key energy conce concepts, and why I care about energy efficiency. Edward is then going to walk you through the energy retrofit journey and we'll share some examples of what is possible. We'll then have a continuation on the trivia with some questions that you should be able to respond after a presentation. So it's not an exam, just a fun way to engage with the content. Jen will then share some insights on the funding available through FCM Sustainable Affordable Housing Initiative. Uh, we'll then have lots of time for your questions, so please be sure to write them down uh, as we go through the slides. We'll end with some concrete next steps for you about how to get started on an energy project with the hope that you can all live with at least one action you can take. Next slide, please. Uh, so because most of you responded that you have intermediate knowledge on the energy efficiency in the intake form and to get us all in the headspace of exploring energy conservation measures, we are going to have a little fun with some energy efficiency trivia. Uh, so to keep this moving, you will only have a few seconds to make your guess, so be ready. Uh, you can go to menti.com and access the, the code 4554 four seven one five and then you'll get prompted to to answer a couple of questions for this trivia i'll pause for a few seconds while some of you join so yeah the first question uh please drop a pin on the map to let us know where you're joining us from or you can also let us know in the chat okay see some good regional balance Lots of people joining in Ontario, BC. Yes, lots of Ontario. Um, I see the numbers have slow, slowed down a little bit, so we can move into the first question of the trivia. So next slide, please. So which of the following is an important way to reduce GHG greenhouse gas emissions, no matter where you are in Canada? We have three options for this question. The first one is adding renewable energy to your buildings. The second, improving energy efficiency to your building systems. And the third, switching your heating system from fossil fuels to electricity. So improving energy efficiency of your building systems will help you reduce greenhouse gas emissions, no matter where you live. In some regions, specifically those that still use coal as a source of electricity, generation could see an increase in GHG emissions if switching from lower carbon to, fusid, to fossil fuels. It is a bit of a trick question for you to get your head in the game. Uh, next slide. Okay, we see that lots of people got it right. Great to see. Um, so the next question is, how much do buildings, including municipal, residential, and commercial buildings, contribute to the national greenhouse gas emissions? 50%, 80%, or 25%? Fifty percent. Wow. Well, the question is eighteen percent. Um, we can go back to the presentation now. Thanks so much for playing that little game with us today. It was fun to explore in a bit more lighthearted way the importance these decisions have for us and for our communities. Um, Sharon, can we go back to the PowerPoint deck? Thanks. 
Um, so to provide some context for today's session, I wanted to let you all know that this summer GMF is publishing its new energy efficiency guide for affordable housing providers, which is a good first step to build the to build your knowledge on energy efficiency. The guide will present a menu of different options for improving energy efficiency in, build, in buildings. And through the guide, you can explore different energy conservation measures to improve building energy performance and explore why these options may or may not be the right choice for your building. By providing basic energy concepts, case studies, and more, the guide uh, can help you identify different solutions and start to think about how to prioritize these to make the right decisions for your context. You will get a copy of the guide on the email you used to register for this webinar. So keep an eye on your inbox this summer. Next slide, please. Um, so energy efficiency solutions are important for many different reasons. They provide opportunities for the housing sector to save on energy bills, which ultimately can lower maintenance costs. Although energy efficiency projects require some upfront investments, it can provide significant savings over time. These savings can then help you to keep rents affordable, and if residents are paying for their utilities, those savings can then be passed on to them. Undertaking an energy efficiency project will also necessitate that you build an understanding of how your building uses energy. So engaging residents in this process can help in build relationships, and with the changes you make, can lead to tangible improvements in resident health and comfort. And of course, it allows for the housing sector to tackle climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Thankfully, the co-benefits make taking action even more enticing. So they support community health and well-being by providing more sustainable, healthier, and comfortable places to live, play, and work. And they help advance other priorities, whether that's adaptation and resilience to climate change, asset management strategies, or, or other development priorities. Next slide, please. Uh, so, as many of you will know, Canada's affordable housing stock is aging. Based on the most recent CMHC data from November 2021, 50 57% of the housing stock was, will be, was built between 1970 and 1989, and another 19% were built before the 70s. This is contributing more than 20% of the stock considered to be fair to poor condition. This means that the affordable housing sector plays a very significant role in producing Canada's emissions and has a critical role to play reducing emissions and our climate footprint. But aside from reducing emissions, the aging housing stock may also mean that providers or the residents are paying large amount of utilities. This can lead to energy poverty, which is defined by the Canadian Sustainability Urban Practitioners as households that struggle to heat and cool their homes and power their lights and appliances. This can lead to resident discomfort, disruption with utilities being shut off, healthcare impacts, and, how, and households may not have enough money for essentials like food and medication. So energy efficiency projects can help you renewing equipment, improving living conditions, and reducing energy costs, both for housing providers and their residents. Next slide, please. But we also want to acknowledge that prioritizing energy projects amongst all of the other priorities can feel challenging. Most of the sectors are small and medium-sized organizations, so resource and capacity constraints are real. This means many staff are wearing multiple hats and don't necessarily have the time or expert expertise to engage in energy efficiency projects. Because of these constraints, providers may, may use a more traditional approach, replacing equipment and making repairs with the same equipment and the aging stock can lead to more complexity when undertaking renovations. But gaining some basic knowledge on energy efficiency can help equip housing organizations with the knowledge needed to start on the undertaking some good planning and securing the support needed. As you will see today, one of the key messages that we want to impart is that you do not have to do it alone. So with that, and next slide please, we are now going to turn into a few slides with some basic energy concepts. I am, I am going to start with the caveat that I am not an energy expert and we're not going to get into technical jargon, but focus on some of the key terms that can help you gain enough familiarity to start engaging with the, with the experts that can help you move forward on your energy efficiency project. So starting with the basics, energy is used to keep your buildings running, 
the main use of energy is for heating, but for cooling, lighting, fans, and hot water. Energy is expressed in and measured in kilowatt hours. Next slide, please. Some of the key concepts you may hear when talking about energy efficiency are the following. First, energy management. It's simply the planning and managing of energy using a building. It is the umbrella for the whole practice of identifying opportunities, taking action to save energy, and reporting on progress. You'll also hear the term baseline performance, which refers to the amount of energy used by a piece of equipment before upgrades. Having a baseline is important so that you can measure your progress. Energy audits will also be among your first steps. And you'll hear the term ASHRAE, which stands for the American Society of Hearing, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, who developed the auditing system. Another common term is energy conservation measure, or ECM. ECMs are the strategies you would use to save energy. They are dozens of ECMs that range from simple, low-cost upgrades to more complex ECMs. Energy models are computer-generated calculations that show you the estimated energy savings of implementing one or more energy conservation measures. There are lots more, but we included those that would that you would want to know as you begin your energy journey. And Edward will be expanding on several of these concepts in his presentation. Uh, so with that, I will now hand things over to Edward uh, to go over his portion of the presentation. Thanks, Paulina. Um, so today, we're going to think of energy efficiency as a journey. Next slide, please. The three types of retrofits that make up this energy efficiency journey that we'll talk about today are minor, major, and deep retrofits. So depending on your level of experience and confidence with retrofits, you may want to start with a minor retrofit. It's a great way to build your experience by addressing low-hanging fruit and generating some quick and easy wins. And if you haven't done any retrofits in your building, there's a good chance there could be some low or even no cost items that could lead to immediate energy and cost savings. Once you've taken on some minor energy efficiency retrofits, this lays a good foundation to start looking at major retrofits. Now we're gonna start looking at the building holistically and looking at those bigger systems and even bundling a few measures together. And once your organization's capacity has been built up and you've identified an older building in your portfolio that has multiple inefficient systems past their service life, it's time for a deep energy retrofit. Deep energy retrofits will address all major building systems, including a building envelope upgrade, and they may even look to add, to add renewable energy source as well. Next slide. So this detailed pyramid of conservation can just help represent or visualize the different parts of an energy efficient journey, but it demonstrates the foundation that is needed to support energy conservation. It starts at the bottom with the most important part, gaining a better understanding of your building and its needs, and then developing an action plan. From there, you can start to address different inefficiencies in your building as you work, work your way up this pyramid, gaining experience. Next slide. But what we really want you to take from today's session is that energy efficiency is a process. And this process is more of a marathon than a sprint. But unlike races, organizations are going to be at different starting points and with different capacities. And that's OK. It's expected. The key is understanding your building or portfolio of buildings and their needs and finding ways that energy efficiency improvements can support your organization's services. You can start by setting up a team or identifying people to work on these projects. Set realistic goals for your organization around energy efficiency, but see it as a journey that you'll be on for a long time as you build your capacity towards deep energy retrofits. And remember, as Paulina said, you're not in this alone. The information we're providing today is just to help build your understanding and excitement about energy efficiency, which you can use to build your team of energy experts. Those are the people that will assess your property, help you navigate all the technical information, and guide you in identifying the energy savings opportunities and determining which projects for you to take on. Next slide. All right, on to this low hanging fruit. Minor retrofits can generate quick wins. And this is great for building your experience and undertaking projects, but also for demonstrating and showing your organization the benefits that energy efficiency can bring. So when looking at energy efficiency, there's two things you can do really to improve it. Reduce waste 
and improve technology. The low to no cost items usually involve reducing waste in some capacity. Low flow faucets and aerators will conserve water and reduce water heating costs. Air sealing your windows and doors is another common measure to reduce heat loss. Upgrading your attic insulation can reduce your heating bills while improving the comfort to your tenants. And energy studies have shown that smart or programmable thermostats, especially in your common areas, can provide energy savings and a short financial payback. And of course, we couldn't talk about energy conservation measures without mentioning LED lighting upgrades. Lighting retrofits are popular due to their short financial payback period and the benefits that improved lighting can provide. Next slide. Here's a lighting retrofit project that took place with the support of BC Nonprofit in Burnaby, British Columbia. A housing society was looking to start some energy management projects through their portfolio of townhouses that were approaching 20 years of age. They decided on lighting retrofits as they're easy to implement and can pose little financial risk. For these projects, they were looking to stack utility rebates and BC housing funding. A lighting contractor was hired to count and detail the number of existing light fixtures and then select replacement LED fixtures. The energy consumed by the old and new light fixtures is easy, is easy to calculate and compare. So the cost savings and rebates were easy to project and the business case could be assessed by the funders. As is typical with LED retrofits, the energy savings for the lighting system reached approximately 45%. Next slide. So moving on to major retrofits. So maybe you've taken on some smaller retrofit items to reduce energy waste, but now you're starting to look at those, that technology of your major building systems. And no longer are you gonna be replacing items with a like-for-like -like model. So major retrofits start to look at the building holistically. This means understanding that your building systems interact with one another and designing new systems with that in mind. If you're in need of, the, if you're in need of any of the minor retrofit items like lighting or air sealing, this is a good time to bundle those measures together. You can also start to look at your space and water heating systems and appliances in need of replacement. You'll need to assess your finances at this point and determine what's in need of an upgrade and start to formulate an action plan. Is there funding available for a single measure that you're in need of? Or are there a bundle of measures that you could package as a major retrofit and then look for funding like through FCM Sustainable Affordable Housing Initiative? And through planning, these major retrofits will pose minimal disturbance to your tenants. Next slide. So for a good example of a major retrofit, let's look at Dunwood Place in New Westminster, British Columbia. So BC Nonprofit followed its usual playbook for this one, beginning with a free, walk-through energy audit, setting up a utility-funded engineering energy study. This study identified the need to replace the boilers and hot water heating system and adjust the existing ventilation system. So the interesting thing about this site was that the existing boilers were only 10 years old. The issue was that when they were installed, like-for-like -like units were chosen and an energy study was not performed. The installed boilers were actually too big for the building and causing a lot of problems, involving them cycling on and off frequently, especially in low heating conditions. The domestic hot water was being heated through instantaneous coils, requiring very hot water and extra boiler runtime, compounding these problems. The recommend re recommendation from the engineers was simple, to replace the boilers with smaller condensing models and replace the instantaneous hot water coils with the storage tank system. For this application, it would prevent the boiler from cycling on and off and allow for staging of the boilers, leading to even more increased efficiency. This upgrade led to a 30% reduction in energy used by the system. And I mentioned that the ventilation system was also identified as a potential target. In this case, it was simply overventilating the space and consuming too much energy in the process. But the existing makeup air unit was relatively new, so it could be modified. The airflow in the building was reduced by almost three times. The supply temperature was lowered, leading to more energy savings. In all, the project resulted in significant operational savings, lower GHG emissions, and provided additional comfort to the residents. Next slide. So deep retrofits. Well, they involve an extensive upgrade to your building's envelope and systems. This can be disruptive to your tenants. So planning for tenant relocation or to undertake a deep retrofit at a time of tenant turnover is recommended. 
building envelope items like your windows, doors, wall insulation, and roof will all be replaced. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems will be retrofitted and likely utilize a renewable technology like ground source heat pumps or solar PV panels. A key element is ensuring the holistic approach by planning for interactions of these different systems. Buildings with poor overall energy performance with multiple systems nearing the end of their service life make good candidates for deep energy retrofits. Next slide. The Sundance Housing Cooperative in the heart of Edmonton's River Valley undertook a deep energy retrofit to the 1970s townhome. They added prefabricated wall panels, insulation, and a new roof with barrier wrap ceilings. The project is estimated to reduce GHD emissions while adding services like central air for residents as ventilation system did not exist prior to retrofit. In deciding what type of retrofit they wanted to complete, the co-op embarked on a feasibility study that mapped out three scenarios for them to consider. One, maintain status quo. A second, bring the existing building up to current code. And the third, a deep energy retrofit. Energy efficiency has always been a priority of this co-op, so the deep energy retrofit was going to get them closer to their goal of being net zero. The retrofit will fully electrify their site by adding air source heat pumps, heat recovery ventilators, and converting water heating from gas to electric. And to account for Alberta's high carbon electric grid, grid renewable energy in the form of solar panels was included to reduce emissions. And with the addition of these solar panels, the co-op's net zero goal has come within striking distance as it will produce 78% of post-retrofit electrical consumption. A key point to highlight is that to unlock the efficiency gains of a deep energy retrofit, it's essential to engage with the people in the building. Co-op members, the residents, were along for this journey. Membership workshops have been held and a newsletter was created to provide continuous updates to residents throughout the project. And for this project, the bonus was the residents were able to remain in-house for the duration of the renovation. Next slide. So a final but critical part of the journey, the costs. How are you gonna pay for building improvements? Well, think of it as enhancing your assets through capital planning. So we know that enhancing your assets costs more money and getting money takes time and effort, like even applying for funding applications. So in the meantime, you need to adjust your budget and capital plan to account for the costs of efficient upgrades instead of like for like replacements. This will give your organization the time to bundle measures and apply to funders with the end goal of improving your operations services while reducing costs. And while we're talking about finances, remember, retrofits can be about more than just a financial payback value. For systems beyond their service life, it's a capital replacement and a retrofit. So looking at the financial payback for the whole project can be misleading in determining the value to your operations. For example, when retrofitting windows that are due for capital replacement, opportunities to install more efficient windows can provide a positive payback as compared to installing new standard windows. It's about finding an opportunity within a replacement that can generate an efficiency gain that will then provide a good payback. In green building projects, it's common to see a conflict between energy efficiency and thermal comfort and indoor air quality. A good example of this was during COVID and the increase in ventilation rates above the normal recommendation. What was good for tenants and staff health and was not good for energy use, but it supported your operations, which is essential. And in BC here last summer with unprecedented high temperatures, this took the issue of thermal comfort and raised it to thermal safety. When adding a cooling load, even at high efficiency, increasing costs and a larger payback period may be expected. Business cases and paybacks do not always account for tenant health and safety. Indoor air quality and thermal comfort can be at odds with energy efficiency. But within your operations, trying to make the most efficient energy, energy choices will support your organization's service, which is to provide safe, secure, and affordable housing. And with that, I'll pass it back to Paulina for some more energy efficient trivia. Thank you, Edward. Uh, so now that we've heard Edward's presentation, I think we can continue the trivia with a few more questions. So please go back to menti.com and use the same code that we used previously. Okay. 
give you a few seconds for everyone to go back to Menti. Sharon, can we switch screens to, to the Menti trivia again? Great. Um, so I have a case study for you. So a three-story building with 10 units showed that its furnace was past its lifetime and was running well below standard efficiency rates. Some leaks were found in the duct system. Choose the type of steps that they could apply. So replacing the 65% efficiency central furnace with 95% efficiency, sealing leaky ducts and pipes, and or replacing boilers and furnaces looking into energy start labels. Okay, I see a good balance among the three steps that they can apply. Um, so all of the all of these options could be applied actually, and the implementation of this ECM could bring up to 30% savings on the heating bill. Um, next slide, please. So the next case study is a townhouse complex with 80 units, undertook a study uh, that took inventory of all exterior light lighting counts and estimated savings to upgrade all, all to LED, which ECM they could apply. Uh, please choose the one that the, the energy conservation measures that could be applied uh, for this organization. Okay, that's great to see the responses. I see that, yeah, there's a certain logic to applying energy conservation measures as I wanted to show in this slide. Uh, so can we go to the response on the next slide, please? Oh, I don't think we can see it, but the responses were installing motion sensors that dim fixtures went on standby and replacing outdoor allergen lighting. So if the organization applied the to correct upgrades, they would have significant savings of lighting, electricity, and maintenance costs. And they would look at a payback of one to two years. It is important to note that installing occupancy sensors can save power even without replacing bulbs or fixtures. And in suite lighting, it's a great opportunity to talk to residents about saving energy. Um, thanks for playing that little game with us today. Uh, that is all for, for the trivia, and I will now hand the mic over to Jen to hear about funding available through FCM Sustainable Affordable Housing Initiative. So over to you, Jen, and we can go back to the PowerPoint presentation. Thanks, Paulina. I was doing the trivia too, so <laughs> I, learned, I learned some stuff as well, so thanks, thanks for that. Um, so, you know, I guess kind of carrying over from where Edward left off in terms of um, enhancing your capital plan, a piece of doing these projects is obviously figuring out uh, how they're going to be funded. And, you know, that's a place where uh, FCM sustainable affordable housing funding can actually help. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our funding, but also the resources that we have available as well that can support you on, uh, on your journey here. So next slide, please. So I'm going to start just with an overview of our funding. So FCM's Sustainable Affordable Housing uh, Funding, Paulina mentioned at, at the beginning, is a $300 million fund. Um, we're focused specifically on supporting energy efficient retrofits and new builds in affordable housing. And so we have funding that will support a project basically from its initial inception as an idea right through its actual construction. And um, so we have grants to help you up front as you are planning your project, starting with our planning grant. That's a simple quick application process. It's a grant of up to $25,000. And the idea of this grant is to just get your project off the ground. So if you have an idea of a project, but you need to do a small piece of work to get it going, um, perhaps a, an initial kind of level one energy audit or um, doing some engagement or starting to engage some consultants on some early planning work, that's where the planning grant can come in to support. 
kind of moving along in, in the journey towards uh, a retrofit project or a new build project. Today we're focusing on retrofits. Um, we then have funding for a study and that's a grant of up to $175,000. That's where you're doing more of your detailed feasibility work, assessing the options and just determining what you're actually going to include, particularly from an energy conservation um, measure perspective in your capital project. I do want to mention though that although we kind of designed these two grants in to kind of build on each other in the stages of, of capital development, you could access just one uh, of the two if that's all that you need in your process. And sometimes um, the planning grant can be applied to what we would typically think would be study work. Perhaps you have funding sourced elsewhere, perhaps the MHC seed funding, for example, and you just wanna do a small piece of work, say to assess, can I add solar uh, to my project, for example, and what would the impact of that be? The planning grant is uh, something that you could access for that as well, if it's just a, a smaller piece of work, but closer to um, getting the finalized project ready to go. We also have a, a grant to do a pilot project. So that would typically be a small scale um, project that you would test and then ultimately try to apply more broadly across your portfolio or a bigger capital project, for example. Um, right now, we are not accepting applications for pilot projects, but we expect that that will be back open in the fall. It turned out to be a very popular offer and we have a limited number of grants available. So we've had to temporarily shut it down. Um, but I do want to mention a great example of that um, is a project in um, in Saskatchewan. It was the first um, net zero affordable housing build in Saskatchewan. Actually, just won uh, the CHRA Sustainability Award at Congress this past year. So do check out CHRA's website and watch the little video on that project. So that was a they received actually both pilot and planning grant funding um, from Sustainable Affordable Housing. So then when it comes to actual construction, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the retrofit side today, because that's again what we're talking about. We have financing available up to $10 million to support your project. Um, for retrofits, we can fund up to 80% of the total project costs. And we actually base our grant on the energy performance. So you can access a grant of somewhere between 25 and 50% of your overall funding from GMF. And that's on anticipated energy performance. So if you were going to do um, a kind of a, a, on the somewhere between the minor and major retrofit that Edward um, showed earlier, say a 25% reduction in energy use, you'd get a 25% grant. A 30% uh, reduction in energy use, you'd get a 30% grant. And if you were shooting for one of the deep retrofits, um, you could access up to a 50% grant if you had a 50% or above reduction in energy use in your building. And I do want to add here as well, because uh, I did see when, when we did the little map uh, at the beginning from where, where, where you're joining from, I did see one dot in the north. And we do have an additional 10% available um, in grant amounts. So a 25% reduction would be a 35% grant, for example, for providers that are in the north, just recognizing there's additional costs and complexity that, that comes with uh, delivering one of these projects in the north. The north includes the territories and the northern part of the provinces as well. We use uh, Statistics Canada's definition for that, and that's available in our, our affordable housing pride. Um, I do want to mention briefly that we have funding for new builds as well. We've taken a little bit of a different approach and here we will fund basically um, the additional cost associated to building with net zero energy ready projects. So we can fund up to 20% of your project and it's a 50% grant up to $10 million. So I will uh, go to the next slide, please. So in order to be eligible for our funding, we uh, look at both the applicant and the project itself. So for applicants, we are looking for municipal governments, municipally owned corporations like housing providers or nonprofit affordable housing providers. And that would include cooperatives as well. Um, so basically provincial territorial housing organizations and private uh, for-profit developers are not eligible for our funding. 
from a project perspective, uh, we take a different approach between retrofits and new builds. So for retrofits, it's that 25%. It's the same as the grant starting point. You need to be aiming to save at least 25% uh, in energy consumption. And for new builds, we're looking for net zero energy ready. And more specifically, we're looking for that TUI that Paulina mentioned earlier, that total energy use intensity of 80 kilowatt hours per square meter. And again, we have a difference um, for that one in the north. In that case, we're looking for 120 kilowatt hours per square meter. And then we are also looking for um, projects that have a that meet a specific affordability criteria. In this case, it's that rents for at least 30% of the units are less than 80% of the local median market rent. That's the same afford affordability criteria as uh, CMHC's co-investment fund. And I should mention here that our funding is completely stackable with any funding in the national housing strategy or with provincial funding or with municipal funding or with private funding. Basically we're, we're stackable across, across the board, but we very specifically did think about stacking with, um, with the national housing strategy programs and particularly co-investment when we were designing this program to try to make it as easy as possible to do so. So next slide, please. So we just wanted to mention, um, we have a, a team dedicated, Paulina is part of it, uh, to capacity building. Um, today, we're actually talking about one of the resources that's coming from our capacity building initiatives, the, um, the coming soon guide uh, to energy efficiency for affordable housing providers. But we actually have a number of tools and resources already available through our website. We have some case studies. We have some fact sheets. You can, you can see one of them um, on here. Um, we also have our application guide on, on this slide as well. We have a resource library as well, and that uh, links to helpful tips, tools, uh, fact sheets, case studies, resources, and it's organized kind of by what stage in development. So it's a great place to, to look as well for a, a number of resources that could be helpful. Um, we tried to do webinars like this, um, so here we are. And then I also did want to highlight, we have a peer learning community of practice um, that's been going on for the last year. So that's for uh, retrofit projects that are accessing our plan and study grants. And that's a place for peers to get to interact. And we basically design a whole training program based on the needs of, of that group. So if you're interested in accessing our funding to get your project off the ground, there's that additional benefit of the ability to connect with, with your peers as you're kind of beginning that project journey or at an earlier stage in your project journey. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, one of our capacity building initiatives that I'm incredibly excited about uh, is our regional energy coach pilot. And we're we're here with one of our regional energy coaches today, Edward from BC Nonprofit Housing Association, but it's a partnership as well um, with the Cooperative Housing Federation of Canada and the Community Housing Transformation Center as well. So we have coaches embedded in these organizations that provide free one-on-one -on -one coaching services to providers across the country to basically help them initiate and plan their energy projects, particularly focused on retrofits. And so that can look like a walkthrough energy assessment, very, very early stages to identify opportunities for energy conservation measures to actually integrate into your project. Um, or it can be working with you through if you've already done an audit and a building condition assessment and identifying opportunities that you could shape into an ultimate capital project um, and building that business case. You can work with regional energy coaches to identify opportunities for funding, of course, one of them being sustainable affordable housing funding here at GMF, but others as well um, that may be a good fit for your project and they can help you uh, in your applications there. There's a whole wide variety of services that are available via these coaches and uh, we have more information. I see it's, it's linked right there. So that has the contact information for all of the coaches across the country that you could reach out to. It's a fantastic partnership that, uh, that I'm really excited about. And I think that's, that's the end for me, Paulina. I'll pass it back over to you. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Now we're going to move into the Q&A period. Uh, so I'm going to invite you to pause for a few seconds to reflect on any questions you have for Edward, 
and Yen. This can be more general questions about energy efficiency or academy specific to your organization or building. Uh, please consider also any questions that you may have about the sustainable affordable housing initiative. Again, this could be more general or feel free to ask specific questions about your unique context. So this is a good chance to to engage with with one of the energy experts. Um, I'll hand it back to to you, Jacob, to moderate the Q and A. Uh, thank you, Paulina, and thank you uh, to Edward and Jen as well for your presentations. They were they were great, very informative as per usual. Uh, so yeah, just like Paulina said, if you have questions, please type them in the chat box or raise your hand, and we'll call on you to ask your question. So while we wait, I think maybe I'll uh, kick things off with a question. Um, how do you pick the right ECM for your building? Um, I, I don't know who wants to jump in there first, but uh, go ahead, whoever. Can I jump in there? Thanks, Jacob. So um, for picking the right ECM for, for the building, I, I would kind of start by throwing the question back on whoever's asking that and be, I need to know more about your building. Um, and, and, and that's that's something that we can work at together. So, and it's systems. So, you know, we need to look at the major, your major building systems, you know, or any nearing the end of their service life, because that's, that's gonna be a good system to look at right there. You know, are there any systems that are the source of repeated complaints from your tenants? Um, so let's, let's start looking at those. Um, and, and from there, get an engineering energy study. That's gonna provide details more details on that existing system, but also uh, the business cases behind retrofit options. So from there, you could have an ECM, an energy conserving measure. Um, you could have a couple choices for one particular system. So you could have a choice that offers you maybe more operational cost savings. And then there might be even a choice that have some cost savings, but also has additional GHD savings. Um, so again, it comes back to your organization and, and what um, its direction is. Great, thanks, Edward. Um, next question, uh, can a candidate apply to the retrofit stream before acquiring a level two energy audit and include the energy audit as one of the milestones in the project workbook? Uh, I, can, I can answer that, yes. Yes, short answer is yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, kind of depending your need, on your needs overall and the stage in your project, it may be that the planning grant or the study grant may be more appropriate. If there's other work you need to do, um, you know, the energy specific related content are an important piece, but your study funding, for example, can fund other type of work as well, architectural work, et cetera. Um, so the audit can absolutely be included. It could be included at either the, the plan or the study stage, depending on kind of your specific needs. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, another question that we had in the chat, uh, for the SAH funding application, would applicants score more points for having uh, many affordable housing units? So the, the example that was given with that question was um, if they had 65% of units below the 80% threshold, would that make our app, the, their application more attractive in the eyes of FCM? Um, yeah, I, I stayed off mute because I saw that one coming, so I'm happy to answer that one too. Um, the short answer to that, I suppose, is no, but with kind of like a little caveat that we do look at the projects holistically. So maybe I'll explain uh, briefly our, the way that we do the evaluation, which I think is a little bit different from, from CMHC. Um, so we have an external um, peer review committee that's a that's a part of the um, assessment process for applications. We use external experts, peer reviewers that review, and there basically are three categories of criteria, I suppose, that are evaluated in, in the project. So the first looks at the like benefits, kind of a triple bottom line benefit approach, but the environmental benefits, particularly as it relates to energy and GHG reductions are kind of top of mind, we'll say, um, from that perspective, but then also with the economic and social benefits as well. We look at them holistically, but we definitely also look at them with the lens of um, energy and GHG benefits in the sense that from an economic perspective, energy savings can translate into cost savings and therefore affordability. And so I think we'd be looking like 
more for that tie as it relates to affordability as opposed to just kind of a specific if you're more affordable then you know here's the number so i think we're looking for that kind of like thought and analysis as it relates to affordability and then similarly on social benefits um we a number of the benefits have been named today but improving um, resident health well-being comfort like those kind of um benefits that come with the environmental measures tied to the social side would also be something that we're looking at. Um, we also look at this kind of relatively in the sense that something at like benefits for a really large housing provider may look different for a smaller one and then you know regional considerations and things like that. Just briefly to mention the other two kind of categories as well, since I'm talking evaluation criteria, um, we're looking basically for strong project management. So that looks at like the financials, the team, the plan, that kind of stuff. And then we also are looking at, we broadly kind of call it sector transformation type of work, but that's where we're looking for is the project doing something innovative either you know, for the sector or for the organization itself. Um, basically like kind of the level of ambition. Are you thinking about how to share your learnings back into the sector and kind of increase the ability for others to do this kind of work as well? So those are the three, I guess, broad categories, the, the, the benefits, like kind of the objectives or benefits, the implementation plan, and then the ambition, I suppose. Amazing. Thanks so much, Jen. That, that really helps. Um, uh, another question we got in the chat, which I, I, I think is a really good one to ask. Um, are our First Nation communities eligible to apply for funding? And if so, is there a separate carve out of the funding for Indigenous housing projects? Um, so First Nations, basically the, the only restriction that we have is that we cannot fund projects that are on reserve, um, but outside of that, we can support First Nation communities. And in particular, we've um, we've seen a lot of actually urban Indigenous pro providers express interest or apply to our funding. Uh, we don't have a specific carve out at this time, but certainly, you know, we would look at that again, kind of holistically, and and would want to prioritize ensuring that we get funding that way. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, uh, a couple questions we got in the chat were related to uh, the the length of time it, it would take uh, for the approval process for some of the the different streams. So, could you maybe talk a little bit more about the the sort of turnaround time from, uh, I guess, like the approximate amount of time to actually put uh, a viable application together and how long it would take for them to get approved? Yeah, for sure. Um, and maybe I'll also speak to the process a little bit. So our planning grant application, it's it's direct, it's online, you can complete it right away and submit it. The typical turnaround time on that is two to three months on average. But of course, uh, depending on how complete the application is and how much back and forth there is, that can, uh, that can add time to the process, uh, of course. For studies, um, we have currently, although we are looking at adapting this details to come, I'm sure we'll share it with CHRA and to share with members if, if we make changes, um, but we currently have an initial proposal um, step. It's a very brief step, particularly at the study stage to confirm you're an eligible applicant, it's an eligible project. You then turn around a full application. Um, so typically, when we get a full application, it would be about four to four to six months to receive a funding decision. Uh, and then um, for the capital project applications, you know, to probably somewhere in the range of six months to a year, kind of depending again on the, on the complexity of the project. We are you know, always working on continuous improvement and, and trying to increase, or I guess decrease in this case, those, those turnaround times on applications. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, so just being cognizant of the time, I know Paulina wanted to add something now. So uh, Paulina, I will hand the floor to you. Thanks, Jacob. And uh, we have all the questions in the chat and we'll be able to follow up with further responses if we didn't get to answer your questions. Uh, but maybe we can answer one more that I saw in there from Sharon. 
uh, that I think Jen, it's also for you. <laughs> so can a housing provider apply for the capital funding without having gone through the earlier funding stages? And um, how long is the approval process for the capital grant financing stream? Okay. Well, I think I answered that that one, um, the six months to a year typically. Um, and yes, you don't need to have gone through earlier stages. You can just apply straight to capital capital project. I would suggest in that case, reach out to um, our uh, outreach advisors just to make sure we do give some guidance in terms of what we're looking for from an energy modeling perspective, particularly for capital projects. It's all in our application guide. We have a, a lot of detailed instructions there, but sometimes it's helpful to, you know, have a have the interaction with with our team. So um, we'll make sure that we put the contact information in the chat so you can reach out and, and work with an FCM staff member to make sure that you're ha having not gone through the earlier stages, you have everything you need to come into our project at that at that stage. The regional energy coaches can also help with that as well. Thank you. Um, so as we get ready to close out this session, I just wanted to leave you with some concrete next steps. So next slide, please. Um, so a great first step is to read the new Understanding Energy Efficiency Guide that will arrive to your inbox this summer. Uh, this guide provides definitions and many more key concepts and also outlines the range of energy conservation measures from lighting to insulation to heat pumps and many more, so stay tuned. And there are also several other capacity development tools that may be helpful for you at various stages of your energy journey. Uh, we'll be adding to a link to the chat box uh, for you to check out our capacity development resources. And someone asked for us to share the resources that have been shared through the chat, and we'll be sure to make we'll we'll make sure to send those in a follow up email as well. And if you haven't already done so, it can be really helpful to identify a staff member to be an internal champion for energy efficiency and lead your future projects. So identifying a board member is also helpful to champion this work at the board level and to keep the board informed. And another great next step, uh, as was mentioned in the chat as well, is to reach out to one of the regional energy coaches to conduct a free virtual energy assessment. So a coach will help you determine your opportunities for energy efficiency and therefore identify what you want to work on. Uh, they can also coach you on how to establish your baseline and uh, on your current energy performance. And the final step, of course, is you can explore how the SAP planning grant can help resource these activities and get your project off the ground. Um, next slide, please. And as we close off the, the, the webinar today, I'd like you to, to enter one next step or one takeaway that you have from, from this session. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your reflections. Uh, we will also leave you with our contact information and a quick two minute survey um, for you to respond. So please take two minutes to reflect on, on a takeaway of this session and an extra two minutes to respond to, to the quick survey. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Paulina. And just to uh, wrap up, uh, th thanks from us at CHRA to our audience for being here and to uh, Paulina, Edward and Jen for the great informative presentation. Uh, it, it was definitely very helpful for everybody interested in conducting an energy audit or, or retrofit projects. So we're going to be uh, sending a follow-up email with uh, some additional information, including a recording of today's session in the coming days. So stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, that's it uh, from our end. So thank you again and take care and stay safe.